everybody, my name is Paris Latka and I'm a Master Nutrition Therapist and an Emotional Eating Coach and I've been a student and of the Bow Spring for three years and teaching the method for a full year and I'm coming at you, we're coming at you from Vital Center for Mind, Body, Health in Denver, Colorado, the home of the Bow Spring and we actually have a drumming class happening in the background so if you hear a little percussion mm -hmm. it's the eternal heartbeat that continues to nourish us all. So I'm with my friend and teacher, one of the most impactful teachers of my life experience thus far, Desi Springer, and I feel so grateful to interview you. Wow, Paris, it's such an honor. When you asked me to do it, I, uh, yeah, I was just thrilled to get to share in this conversation with you. I think it's really a deep one and one that hasn't been heard enough, and that when people are interested in, in learning about Bow Spring, that this is a this is a conversation that comes up and so it's my it's my great delight to be here. Here we are. Okay. So for the people who don't know what the Bow Spring is, please share with us. What is the Bow Spring? Oh my gosh, so many things. So it's a it's an ergonomic practice for mind body health where we learn how to support ourselves as adults. You know, when we're babies, we are cuddled and swaddled and fed and cared for and loved and reassured in every moment. And then comes this point in time where we have to do that for ourselves. And so the bowspring is something that it can, it, it, you know, it's a technology to, to self-support, to gain self-trust, to be able to be our best in the world. Uh, I said ergonomic because it's applicable to every daily life activity, walking, standing, sitting, anything that I do now is informed by this practice. It's also meditative so uh, and, and includes an aspect that's very strong with mindfulness. So it's mind training as well as our physical body training. There's a part of the bow spring that in the beginning is really a process of reprogramming. You're waking up inside of this embodiment in a new way and you're given the options and the wherewithal and the, the understanding to choose uh, you know, what programs, what patterns do I want to support, which are the healthy patterns in my life that I want to adopt, I want to strengthen in order to be my best. We know we're going to be patterned and so the Bowspring is a reprogrammer of patterns. So whenever we want to learn anything new, we can count on the Bowspring to facilitate that learning process and to make us the best students that we could be, students of life really. Mm. Love it. And I just want to clarify, Desi Springer is the founder of the Bow Spring Method. I am. Yes, yes. Along with John Friend. Along with John Friend, yes. of course. Co-founder. Yes. Co-founder. And so tell us how the Bow Spring came to be. Gosh. Well, it was a time when, you know, um, big change. It was like a big fork in the road. And a lot of things that were outside of my control. Um, one of which was the dissolution of the Anyasara uh, community and the struggles and the, the, the challenges that they faced in 2012 as a community by way of the scandal, the Anyasara scandal. Um, I was a part of that community for seven years and studied with John uh, avidly and you know at the time the studio was a full Anyasara studio, uh, thriving and well and um, to see not only the you know the drama of the scandal but also to recognize that the practice of Anyasara was what we needed as a community to fall back onto in such a challenging time and what I noticed is that the practice was falling sh falling short for us as a community mm -hmm. and the reason that I could say such a generalization is because of how people reacted and responded to John Fran's scandal. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, we were really without tools as a community. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how to face the storm in the highest way. Instead, we made this, you know, intense stampede and everybody tried to disassociate with what they thought had turned sour and it was a grand loss and a demonstration that the practices that we had been keeping and that we had been um, imbibing in uh, were not there for us when we needed them to be. And so part of it was that I realized that we need to learn, we need to study something different in the other, in the everyday in order that when the, the storm really hits, 
that we have this sense of preparedness. So that was one thing. Another thing was that I was always told, you know, regardless of the physical movement, um, that I had too many curves and that I was going to hurt myself. You know, I remember my first chiropractic visit, the chiropractor told me, and this was before even I was practicing modern postural yoga, but he told me, you are for sure going to have arthritis because in your spine, because of the depth of your lumbar curve. And just these kinds of messages, um, you know, st uh, teachers that were really trying to help me, but were all about taking out my curves and trying to lengthen my spine and to make me as straight as possible. And so there was a part of me that felt a little bit of a relief that the community of Anyasara had disbanded because it gave me a new opportunity to really see what did I need to do to best support my own health, my own body, and how, how was my body best supported. Meanwhile, I was dating an NBA basketball player and in studying his body and someone, you know, as far as athletes that I've ever met, he's uh, by far one of the most athletic and, uh, and a performance athlete over the course of many years and through different mediums and expressions of athleticism. He's an Olympic gold medalist. Um, and when I looked at his body, his glutes were never going down. Mm -hmm. They were so stacked up and he had incredibly pronounced curves and he was so powerful, like a modern day gladiator. And I realized that curves are not actually about our weakness, that there is a chance that an elongated curve can actually be the strongest expression of the spine. And so to, you know, to start to shift that idea about being an athlete, being powerful, feeling empowered, and giving myself the, you know, the tools and the wherewithal to be able to face the challenges of my daily life, I realized that straightening the spine wasn't working for me. Mm -hmm. And that my body was more like his with its curviness and the way that the glutes were going up. And that was just something that I always had, you know, as part of my uh, postural anatomy. Um, and so I didn't, you know, I, I had a, a revelation that curves are not bad. Mm -hmm. I've, I've learned my whole life that curves are so bad mm -hmm. and I have these awful bad curves mm -hmm. and then I start to realize wow look at this other person that I respect and admire so much and you know that I've seen conquer you know every different sport uh, challenge and you know and when I asked him about it because then of course I had to say what do you think about the glutes going down and he said oh no way that mm -hmm. is just then you're, you're disempowering yourself. Your glutes are an engine, they're a motor. Your back body pushes you from behind in order that you can propel and be progressive in your movement forward. So it was those main things. One, that the community was you know, uh, dissolving and going through a terrible, challenging time where people were not being loving and kind and compassionate as I knew that was always the highest ideal for us as a community, but people instead were ripping themselves and ripping each other apart. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that we were ill-prepared Mm -hmm. by way of the Anyasara practice to face difficult challenges in our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also, I, I didn't agree with uh, the straightening of the spine anymore. Mm -hmm. I just, and especially then after I started recognizing this, this athlete that I see as, you know, such a, such a incredible, splendid expression of athleticism and power, total power, and um, to see that it was all by way of the curves, not by way of a straight line. Mm -hmm. So those were the things that, that really were a catalyst for a, f a fissure in my thinking because I really, I had a view and it was established and I had ingrained that same view of the standard model, which is stack your bones, straighten your spine, pull the two ends apart to get it longer. You know, I had, I had, uh, been a proponent of that. I had taught so many people that I had been dedicated to that vision. Mm -hmm. And then these things started happening and it was a catalyst for a wake up that was like, you know what, what you thought isn't, isn't mm -hmm. the way you thought. Mm -hmm. It's not what you thought. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and rethink. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that, you know, life oftentimes when it wants us to wake up, the universe wants us to wake up to something, it knocks not just once, but 
it knocks again and then eventually it's pounding down the door you know what I mean just like listen wake up and so I felt really blessed to receive the information and the and the um, also the support from my local community you know my business partner Micah Springer my sister um, she also was in favor of the idea of curves and you know I knew that um, I would be supported Mm -hmm. um, by at least my nuclear family mm -hmm. and uh, and eventually after eight months time by John Fran someone who I held as you know an expert in anatomy the, the most knowledgeable person on the subject of anatomy and mathematics and geometry and physiology that I knew and so I felt that you know once I had his support I had the support of my family the support of the local community then um, it was it was just a green light from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was just undeniable. How was your body feeling at the end of the Anusara days for you? Like when your body, like, were you desiring to untuck your tailbone and to feel that curve in yeah, our spine, or like? Yeah, it's interesting because physically I had no pain. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, "Oh, I had so much pain," you mm -hmm. know, tucking the tail or doing all of these things. I really didn't have any pain. Um, what I had was a lot less power. And most specifically, when we're talking about the alignment of melting the heart or mm -hmm. bringing the shoulder blades together on the back side mm -hmm. of the chest or the back side of the rib cage, and uh, making that aspect of ourselves smaller on the inside but stronger on the outside, that was the part and the tucking of the tail. I, I did a campaign when we first changed to Bowspring, and it was this you know, I made t shirts and stickers that were buck the tuck. <laughs> yeah, and I just thought it was, um, you know, I was inspired by our local sports team, the Broncos. Mm -hmm. Colorado has that feeling of the wild, wild west. And, you know, I just, I, I didn't have any pain, but I felt this crazy urge to buck, mm -hmm. to buck Paris. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wasn't going to be melting my heart. I was going to be growing my heart mm -hmm. because I need my heart to be big. Mm -hmm. I need my heart to be strong. I don't need my heart to succumb and, and you know, and bow down. I need my heart to, to be light and to be bright and to stand up. And so there was more of an emotional counterpart that had me really want to change. Mm -hmm. I, I knew it was time for a change. Oh my God, that's so inspiring. <laughs> um, so how does the Bow Spring support every person being in their unlimited potential? Yeah, in a few ways, this is great. Um, one is that aspect of the rib cage that's at the center of our practice and oftentimes people see bowspring they you know they they see it being practiced they see the curves of the body and they think that the prioritization is around the glutes and i think it's a little bit of um our eyes not being trained to see the truth of what's really happening mm -hmm. and because it's so new you know mm -hmm. it's really I mean, we've even had people almost walk into the glass panes at the front of the building because they saw the bowspring shape and it was so disorienting to them, mm -hmm. a shape they'd never seen, that they, you know, they really lost themselves. <laughs> I've seen people almost get injured just looking at the shape. So, you know, um, I think that the, our eyes don't recognize that really the whole premise of the practice is about building the ribs. And the ribs, if we could say, if, you know, their physical presence is at the center of our torso, the base to the crown, the ribs are at the very center. It holds our heart, which oftentimes is called the home or the seat of the soul, mm -hmm. um, that area. So it's at the center. It has the seat of the soul. Uh, another way that people liken it is to the home of our self-concept. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine that if that place is small, because anytime we perceive a pressure from the outside, our ribs don't expand naturally. Our protective defensive default is to contract the ribs. And so you go through life, you take a hit, you take another one, you have a heartbreak, you have a loss, you know, and the ribs without continual practice of opening and expanding and prioritization of that fullness, they get small and hard and go down. Mm -hmm. And so then this is your idea of yourself, is smaller, harder, and downward in its energy. Whereas Radiant Heart, which is at the center of our practice, is out in every direction and upward. And so you start to reframe and reshape the center of your being, um, your self-concept, and also the you, you start to change the home of the seat of your soul mm -hmm. 
And it's crazy to me, this is something I totally never expected, but when I started teaching Bowspring to others, one of the things that they would report back with most frequency was, I know I'm out of pain and it's totally weird because I'm doing all these weird things that I never thought to do that would help me with my pain, but also I feel somehow strangely confident. Mm. Mm. I feel like I can do the things that before I was afraid to even look at, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so it's uh, that, so this, this, this biggering, which isn't a word, but that I love to use because I, it just describes it so well. It's this expansion of an internal concept. You start to not only expand it physically and in space, but you fill it with light. Mm -hmm. And so then you're in every day when you're doing your practice, you're basically making a deposit of light mm -hmm. into your own account. So you're building your self-esteem, you're building your concept of self, you're building um, your sense of safety. Um, that takes me to the next point, is that Bowspring is all about the shape of the ribs being expansive, upward rising, uh, and as well igniting and activating the posterior chain. The posterior chain is the entire back of your body from your skull all the way to the points of your toes. And it's seamless, where a muscle will start and stop. The posterior chain of fascia is from, it's, it's one singular sheath of, you could even imagine like a fabric or a weaving. Um, it's, you know, made of collagen. It's, it has um, 10 times the strength, fascia, and collagen has 10 times the strength of steel. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly elastic, super strong. And they say that, you know, when we engage it, that we're activating how it's referenced is the muscles of trust. And so when I talk about that and teach about that, it's not learning to trust someone else. It's learning how to trust yourself. And so you finally get this feeling of, I've got my back. Mm -hmm. When those muscles activate and engage on command, and when you're, you know, and it's because of your relationship to them, because for most people, they're so sleepy and dull and dead, they're not supporting us in our everyday life. Mm -hmm. Not emotionally, not physically, not mentally. Mm -hmm. But when we start to have this revolution, a postural revolution where the body, the back body starts to come online and wow, you feel like you have a team behind you. Mm -hmm. You have, you're not alone. You're not alone. You, you're supported. And it's the best kind of support because you don't have to look for it outside of yourself. It stems from inside. So it's those two key factors that really prepare somebody to take on whatever challenges, to build whatever dreams, to reach whatever goals, you know, to, to, to leap higher than they ever thought to fly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's those things that give us that chance where other practices in the past have fallen short to give us that that real awakening, that real sense of self that stems from inside. Wow, powerful. So powerful. Um, so a few years ago, you had helped me overcome a chronic neck pain. Oh, thank you so much. It was awful. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember after a class one day, you pulled me aside and expressed to me that I was continuing to collapse through the back of my ribs mm -hmm. and that if I were to do that, then I would just prolong the issue and I wouldn't sustainably heal. After you spoke to this, you, you shared with me, the world needs you to be big. We need you to play big. We need your big light. Please don't shrink back. And I remember you looking at, looking at me in my eyes and, and almost pleading with me, like, keep your ribs full. We need you to play big. And um, that was very touching for me. And it's really escorted me into another level of biggering in my life. And I'm wondering if you can please speak to what playing big means mm -hmm. to you and how does the bowspring support this? Yeah. And you've spoken a little bit about that, but I would just love to hear more. Yeah. I don't believe that any life is a mistake. If we made it, you know, I've been, um, I've had the gift of, of studying some uh, prenatal uh, and just, you know, basically the, the miracle of birth and, and life and uh, to, to have a baby, to get pregnant, it is basically a miracle. We think, we, you know, our minds are trained to think like, I have to protect against this because it's so common. 
if you got pregnant, mm -hmm. it is because it's like so many things lined up mm -hmm. that life came to be. So I really believe that if we're alive and we're embodied, it's by no means a mistake. And that we have something we're supposed to be giving, doing, serving, and offering a contribution. And anyone who holds back, who gets small on the inside and hard on the outside, is never going to share that gift. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in the years that I've known you, Paris, you're uh, an incredibly extroverted, delightfully positive person who cares about people. You want to help. You're a helper. When you introduced yourself, even in this interview, you talked about the specific ways that you are dedicated to helping people. And I know that that's what drew you to the Bow Spring in the beginning is because you were attracted to a technology that you knew could help so many of the people that you love and care about. And so for me to think about you going through life and not sharing that mm -hmm. is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're, it, it, it's just so, I, I know that each one of us, we have to play big. We've got to step outside of our small selves and go out on a ledge and in a way that, you know, to not, the, the, when the whole tagline came out, no fear, I thought that's a little bit lacking in intelligence because fear is real and fear is necessary and it's, it, it helps us to some degree, but we also need to be able to have a responsiveness to our fear default or our fear def defense, you know, that is there to protect us. But we also need to be able to, in the morning mo moment when we feel the fear, we need to gauge the situation. Is there a true danger? Mm -hmm. Am I in danger? Mm -hmm. A lot of the fears that we experience are about sharing our vo sharing ourselves or being more vulnerable or offering our art or extending, you know, um, telling someone that we really have feelings for them when we don't know if they have them for us or, you know, it's like a lot of times it has to do with um, something that is not at all life-threatening. Mm -hmm. And fear really serves us for the times when it is life-threatening. And so to recognize when it's not life-threatening and that this is just something that, you know, that this fear that I'm coming up face-to-face -face with is just a demonstration of a growth opportunity. Mm -hmm. We should be scared when we're doing what we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And I mean that as far as like a life purpose. So like when you find, you, you get a hit, an intuitive hit, like, oh, I'm going to do this. But then there's this secondary experience where it's like, oh, but you're not big enough. You're not fast mm -hmm. enough. You're not smart <laughs> enough. You don't have the resources, you know. And so it's like we have to be able to mitigate that secondary response to an opportunity in life and recognize that, okay, even though I'm scared, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. We, row our, we, we weigh our pros and cons and we recognize, no, there's actually more chance for benefit on this scary side of me opening and offering and vulnerably stepping into who I've always wanted to be, who I've dreamed about being my potential. You know, um, we need to, to be able to uh, work with that aspect of ourselves and realize this isn't life threatening. Mm -hmm. This is ego threatening. Very. <laughs> and there's such a difference, right? And doubt threatening. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then, but what's crazy is that the fear, the fear rises in, in both scenarios. So mm. for us to be able to say, okay, it's not life-threatening, it's ego-threatening. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, so I, I think that that's one of the, the, the things that we all have to face every day is that, am I going to let my fear get in the way of my life purpose? <sighs> am I going to let my fear keep me small and keep me from being my potential that I was born to be? Mm -hmm. You know, am I going to let my fear get in the way of me making my offerings and my and and sharing my gifts mm -hmm. with this world? Mm -hmm. And it's like hell no, hell no, you can't. Well, not any longer, <laughs> right? Like, right? 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 Not any longer. I recognize how that has served me in a way yeah. to let me come to this point where I can't hold back. I don't want to hold yeah. back. Right. And maybe that's the driving force of our evolution forward if we're going to coexist in harmony and... Yeah. Yeah. And see, and the thing that I think that also happens, because you said, how does the bowspring prepare us to do this? Well, the bowspring, you know, oftentimes when we have fear and we also have pain, 
then fear is harder to get rid of if you have pain. Sure. They go hand in hand. Absolutely. So at that point, you had a physical pain mm -hmm. in your neck. Mm -hmm. It was hurting. Mm -hmm. It's scary because mm -hmm. it's like, this is chronic. I'm a young woman. Mm -hmm. I want to be my best, but I'm in pain. Mm -hmm. I'm living with pain. And I don't know what to do to help myself. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, Bowspring, it's an alleviator. Uh, it's a balancer. So it alleviates pain very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and because pain often stems from imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a technology that helps you to balance, balance your tissues, balance the relationship of push-pull within your body, um, you know, balance your mind, train your mind, har you know, har harnesses and focuses the power of your mind, then the fear, it just doesn't seem to have the same potency mm -hmm. as when you're in pain, when you feel small, and you don't have a technology to facilitate change. Mm -hmm. So beautifully said. And it's been really cool. I've been learning a lot of what is physiologically happening when we lift the rib cage and open the belly and different neurotransmitters that are released and decreasing cortisol. And yeah. so as you're sharing this part of the equation, I, my mind is just yeah. like it's all synergizing into really like this is a method to propel us. Yeah. to lift us yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's like a big mama method mm -hmm. it's a oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just because it's, you know, it does, it, it that's what it renders for every single mm -hmm. person who does it is a feeling of like, I'm supported, mm -hmm. I'm held, I can do this, mm -hmm. I'm born to do this, mm -hmm. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So where in your life do you still play small? And how do you shift out of that to remember to play big and your big purpose um, in this world. How do you tell us about that process yeah. for you? Yeah, yeah. That's so great to hear um, that question because I don't think that we ask it of ourselves enough. Where am I playing small? Mm -hmm. And how can I, you know, how, what, what technique or medium do I use to overcome? Um, I notice that um, there's a voice in my head oftentimes that has yeah, that the volume has varied throughout the, my life. You know, sometimes it's been louder, sometimes it's been quieter, but um, it's the not enough, a not enough voice, you know, um, and it can show up in many different ways. Um, recently, I had an experience, we, um, and I say recently, but it was about a year ago, had an experience where we needed to do some filming for Bowspring, and I was really uncomfortable with the camera. And um, I recognized that Ever since I was younger, I didn't like to be in pictures. I didn't want to be in the camera. I felt, you know, um, uncomfortable. And um, I've, you, you know, so it's a place that in the past I've flown under the radar. I've avoided being up front and center. You know, I've um, skirted the, the full responsibility of stepping up into my, my potential. And, um, and I really realized that with this practice that my relationship to insecurity is shifting. It's really changing. The insecurities are not changing, but my relationship to the insecurities are changing. Mm -hmm. And it's the same as, you know, we, we talk about in our practice and we just did our teacher summit where we delve deep into the shadow, the somatic shadow, the body, the, the psycho-emotional, physical uh, baggage or traumas or heartaches that we, um, have with us that we carry with us and our insecurities our um our small self and you know it's uh it's just it's so interesting how much the practice changes that relationship where now i feel like i can recognize small self she exists there is a small desi mm -hmm. for sure mm -hmm. and she's terrified you know um but i can recognize that aspect of myself and be the one to comfort and calm that part of myself mm -hmm. and say, it's okay, it's normal to feel scared, you know, but the end result that we're looking, you know, which is the communication of this message, for me has eradicated any um, fears in playing small, um, you know, in, in holding back, not because, I think because I don't take it personally anymore. So now it's more about rising up to be the conduit and the voice of this message 
is so important to me that I forget that I have to rise up to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that needs to happen nice. so oh, much wow. that I forget that it actually takes something different of me that I have been able to give in the past. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it, I'm a normal human being. I, I face my insecurities, but I do feel that I have a different relationship to them than I ever have before. Mm -hmm. um, earlier this year, I posted a pose in my um, a picture of a, a bikini. I was in my bikini from the back. And that was something I would have never done in Paris. Mm -hmm. I would have never done that. Um, in fact, on you know, being on Facebook for nine years, I never did that mm -hmm. in nine years, and uh, I didn't do that before either. You know, so it was like. Um, but one day, I just woke up and I thought, I'm not, ash I'm not ashamed. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm not doubting. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. That's what I felt. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Not like I'm perfect, but I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. And I and I'm okay with me right now. I will never stop trying to be better, mm -hmm. but I'm okay with where I am right now, and I honor myself, and I honor my past, and I see my insecurities so clearly. It's like, oh, that's small, Desi, okay, mm -hmm. I see you, mm -hmm. I see you, you know, but I don't need to heed to you, mm -hmm. heed to your warnings, or mm -hmm. heed to your, you know, your uh, negative messages for me to stay quiet, mm -hmm. small, and mm -hmm. in the dark. It's like, it's time to... Time to come forward with this message. I love the imagery of small Desi or small Paris, or we mm -hmm. all have our small people mm -hmm. inside of us, mm -hmm. and then like learning how to embrace these people and be like, oh, it's okay, and right. I'm not gonna let you dr ride, drive the show anymore. Right. Yeah, I'm still gonna do it, and like I hear you, and you're safe. Yeah, like you're so safe. So yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's imagery. kind of like I mean, I just thought of when you were talking about the imagery it brought up for you is I was thinking of a family road trip. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's one person with their hands on the steering wheel. That's hopefully the big person, mm -hmm. the big self. Mm -hmm. Because the child mm -hmm. needs to be in the car seat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> or I forgot about the gas station. <laughs> Oops. Right. It's like, you're safe, you're buckled, you're yeah. in the back seat. Yeah. But the, you know, it's like there's, there's appropriate, there's roles that all of us, there, and there's aspects of self, facets of our personality and of our person and of our soul mm -hmm. that are so, you know, they're multifaceted. Mm -hmm. We're so interesting, mm -hmm. each of us, so complex and unique. But at the same time, it's like not every aspect of self should be the one with the hands on the steering wheel. And so I'm really careful about who I put at the wheel now. Yeah. I don't let the children drive. Uh -huh. <laughs> Until they still like keep <laughs> <laughs> the no, keys. No, no, no. <laughs>